Well, thank you, Lisa, again, for joining us. For, for our audience, um, pleasure to have, an honor to have joining with us, Lisa Daftari, who is a Iranian-American journalist. She has been everywhere from the Middle East to uh, Latin America to Europe, uh, advocating on behalf of human rights, on behalf of uh, the corruption and support of terrorism that the Iranian regime has carried out uh, for decades and throughout the world and recently has a new podcast uh, on, on YouTube and also on Apple and everywhere where the podcast is available called The Foreign Desk, which I highly uh, recommend and, and encourage everyone to participate. Lisa, it's great to have you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Joseph. So let me tell you, Lisa, a little bit about the show and then I, obviously we wanna learn about you. This is a primarily Latin American audience. Everyone from uh, Latinos here in the United States to Venezuelans, Mexicans, Colombians, uh, Argentinians. And we talk a lot about Iran on the show. Obviously, you know the work that I do, but we don't necessarily talk about what Iran's doing in their own country. We talk a lot about what Iran's doing on this side of the world. But as I mentioned in many of the, the previous episodes, previous shows, it's only as important what Iran can do in this part of the world relative to what's going on in their home front. So I want to ask you a little bit about that. But before we do that, tell us a little bit about yourself. You have a very unique perspective because of your background and because of your expertise. So tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into this, how you became an expert on Iran and how you started looking at all these uh, challenges that Iran presents to the United States and I think to the world. Well, thank you so much, uh, Joseph, for having me. And um, thank you to the audience for caring about these topics and watching shows like this one to educate yourselves on this very important topic. Um, obviously, I have a very close tie with the uh, Latin American uh, community. It's, it's un placer uh, to be here and to talk with you. Um, I am of Iranian uh, American descent. My parents are from Iran. I was born in the United States, but from a very, very young age, uh, I saw this necessity to correct the narrative of how Americans um, or Westerners understood uh, the Iranian regime, the threat. To me as a young child, it was the reason why my parents emigrated to the United States and why I never saw my, my homeland of, of Iran. And I remember from the first time I wrote a long-term paper in eighth grade, it was to correct this narrative of who, who was the Shah of Iran? What do the Iranian people want? How are they suffering under this current regime? Because here in the West, this has always been a lost narrative, a contrived narrative, uh, often hijacked by those who support the regime or perhaps don't even understand the threat of the Iranian regime. Uh, and for that reason, um, you know, I, I never had plans to become a journalist. I never had any, any sort of intention to become a political analyst to do what I do right now. Uh, but it came very naturally. In college, I took uh, Middle Eastern studies courses, uh, other political science courses. And I, again, became the person who was correcting the narrative in class. Uh, and I remember one day I was I was both pre-med and pre-law, but I remember telling one of my roommates, I wish I could make a career out of this where I just really just correct the narrative all the time and speak on behalf of the truth and, and the people who are suffering under these very repressive regimes unbeknownst to the rest of the world. Uh, I think oftentimes uh, the American people, the West, um, the mainstream media, they're well-intentioned, but perhaps they don't have the knowledge, they don't have the tools, they don't have the talking points that are necessary to explain what's going on in the world. Uh, if I tell you, for example, that the Iranian regime is sitting at the footbed of America, right here at our southern border, would you believe me? Uh, it's things like this that um, I have, you know, really built a career upon, really telling people what's going on, how we can, what we can do uh, to, to not only correct the narrative in the mainstream media, but to um, educate ourselves and, and perhaps create this awareness that could have a reverberation to help the people in need and the human rights uh, victims in need. Uh, and for that reason, um, I became a journalist. I went to journalism school and um, became, you know, um, I worked for the mainstream media for many, many years. And then now uh, I am an independent journalist. I have my own platform called The Foreign Desk. Thank you for the plug, Joseph. I have a weekly uh, podcast where I bring on various guests um, who are experts in this region and in terrorism. And um, I also do a daily top 10 email that really gives you the top 10 news stories you need for the day. And that really covers everything, domestic news, um, news from Europe and around the world, the Middle East, of course. 
um, South America. And uh, I suggest you, you sign up if it's something that you're interested in, in, in knowing and in educating yourself early in the morning. This comes to your uh, inbox early and uh, it really sets you up for the rest of the day with, with regards to what you need to know. No, that's 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 uh, perfect. And I highly recommend that everybody do sign up for the top 10. This is top 10. It's on the forum. We're actually going to put a link to it at the bottom here on the screen. And, you know, I people ask me oftentimes, where do I get my news? I, say, I don't really get my news. My news comes to me. I just open my email and you open it. And one of the ones that I open is, is Lisa's top 10. And I kind of see what are the major stories and, and you have good perspectives. So, Lisa, I think, you know, what you said about challenging the narrative, right? And that's, and that's a difficult thing to do because the narrative's in multiple languages. I remember during the nuclear negotiations prior to the JCPOA of 2015, the way Iran would spin the narrative would be one type of narrative in English, another type of narrative in Farsi and, and, and to their own population. And even, you know, obviously I'm looking at some of the stuff in Latin America and even a completely different narrative in Spanish. And so it's almost like you have this bipolar Iranian regime that's speaking in different tones to different audiences. But t tell us about this because you've done a lot of that work at correcting the narrative, but what is the narrative right now inside Iran? How is the Iran speaking to the Iranian people? Something that many of us don't get to see because we don't read Farsi or we don't understand mm -hmm. the languages, but you do, so you get to look at it. How is Iran reacting right now to the current state of affairs in its country? And, and I mean the Iranian regime. Yeah, the regime. Yeah, exactly. We have to say the Iranian people and the Iranian regime, two very, very different ideas, two very, very different sentiments and different realities that they're living. Joseph, um, you correctly stated, you know, the, this narrative that, that comes into play and how does it exist in so many languages? How does it reach so many shores? How does it reach so many important publications and trickle into, um, you know, the, 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 how does, you know, the foreign minister of Iran, Javad Zarif, get a, a, a primetime interview on CNN, for example? And the answer to that is that the Iranian regime is the most egregious pop propaganda machine ever in the world. Whenever we see the Chinese or the Russians putting out this kind of propaganda, my first reaction is that they learn this from the Iranian propaganda machine because there is nothing like it. The way that they're able to Trojan horse themselves, embed themselves in society through movies, through you know um, interns, through uh, people working in Washington DC and now getting promoted to work inside the Biden administration. You know, uh, comedians, actresses, actors, all sorts of people that in a very soft way are able to promote the Iranian regime as not being as bad as they are, really giving them a softer image, giving them the image that the people of Iran are happy and that the sanctions that the U.S. is placing on the Iranian regime is only affecting the Iranian people and that a nuclear deal will, will help the Iranian people and it will help normalize uh, the relations. And it's just the opposite, Joseph. And, and you know this very well, uh, looking at the reports um, from inside the country, how, how the people are so disenchanted. There's currently a campaign going on that's gone viral on Twitter um, that says no to the Islamic Republic. It's hashtag no, the number two, IR. And in Farsi, it's Naba Jomhuriya Islami. So they are trying to um, you know, and they have made this viral, but they're trying to show the rest of the world, just like they began doing in 2009 at the Green Revolution, showing the world, we don't, we don't, this government doesn't speak for us. We don't want this government. We didn't choose this government. And we have a different story to tell. 82 million strong, these Iranians have come to social media. They have become citizen journalists. And it's through them that we're getting the real narrative, the real story of what's going on, not only in Iran, but where the money is going. You know, maybe back in the day, the Iranian people were fooled by their government when they came into power in 1979, 1980, to say that, you know, um, Israel is our enemy, the United States is our enemy, and we um, we have our allies in the region, the Palestinians, for example, you know, other Arabs are, are, are our brothers because we're Muslim first and Iranian second. Mm -hmm. That has evolved. The Iranian people are saying no to that. They're saying our money, and, and you can hear this um, from the slogans that have evolved on the streets of Iran. Every time there's a round of, of protests where people are going out, and I'm sure many of you have heard all these different rounds of protests going on every few months or so, 
the slogans have become entirely different. They're not just calling out for reform anymore because reform doesn't exist in this system. It's all the same. They're calling for a removal of the entire government. They're calling on them. They're calling them out, I should say, for putting the Iranian people's money into terrorism in Syria, in Yemen, in Iraq, to the Palestinians in Gaza. And for that reason, they don't want an Iranian deal. This is what the, the news is not telling you. The mainstream media is not telling you. That deal is not for the people of Iran. Actually, it, it goes against their cause because it lets their government off the hook. What it, the deal is for is to loosen the sanctions, uh, give more money to the government of Iran that will only put more pressure on the people and put more money into terrorism. And for that reason, you know, if you care about this topic, if you care about human rights, if you care about women's rights, that's where you have to look and say, you know, what are we being told in the mainstream media? And why are we pushing? Why is the Biden administration pushing for another nuclear deal? It actually reminds me everything you're saying, kind of like of the situation in Venezuela. There's these fake narratives about sanctions, sanctions, uh, sort of a victimization in front of the sanctions, uh, the Iranian people in this case, the Venezuelan people in that case, rising up, trying to have their voices heard. But so for those, that, and the audience can be very familiar with uh, the Venezuela situation. And what the, the, the Venezuelans are very used to is a lot of uh, fervent opposition within the people, the civil society, but a lot of lack of political will among their opposition leaders. And this has been the story of Venezuela. Like mm -hmm. oftentimes there's been moments where the regimes are weak, the regimes, they're not impervious, uh, but in that moment where there might be an opportunity, uh, their political leaders have failed them. How does this hold up to the Iranian opposition, who's obviously has been around a lot longer because the, uh, the the regime, the dictatorship in Iran has been around a lot longer for more than 40 years. How's, what's the state of the Iranian opposition? Are there any real leaders that can rise up to the regime and actually lead a, a civil movement, a civil society movement uh, to get away from uh, the, the grip of, of, of the Ayatollahs? Yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head. The major issue with the Iranian opposition is that there are so many different groups and there's not one um, organized leader or one organized movement. Uh, this la latest campaign that I just referenced, that has actually been one of the most uh, unifying campaigns because it's very simple. It just says no to the Islamic Republic. It doesn't talk about the next steps. Well, no to them, but yes to whom? Uh, and that's the question, you know, who, who will organize this? Who's going to step up? What I will tell you is that on the streets of Iran, one of the protests that we've heard, uh, one of the slogans rather that we've heard throughout the, pro the recent protests has been to call upon the son of the Shah, the Prince Reza Pahlavi, who resides on the East Coast of the United States, um, <clears throat> who has not been in Iran since he was a young child and has lived in exile when his father was toppled and this regime took over. So it's it's very um, it's very nostalgic for them to call upon him. They are remembering a time when Iran was better. Now, also add to that, two thirds of the population of Iran, so two thirds of eighty or so million people, are under the age of forty, meaning they were born after the Iranian Revolution. They didn't they never lived under the Shah, but they have this faux nostalgia for a history for for a time that they inherited through their parents' stories. And for this reason, they blame their parents. They actually are saying to their parents, what the heck were you thinking going out and protesting to topple the shawl? Look, look what you've done to our lives. Um, and this is not something that we wanted and it's something that we want to change. So for that reason, they're calling on, you know, the, the Prince Pahlavi, Reza Pahlavi, to be a leader, to be a symbol, at least if nothing more than a symbolic figure uh, to take them into the next chapter. But um, Joseph, you and I have talked about this before where, you know, it's, if it's a true grassroots movement, similar to the one in Venezuela, um, it's very difficult to import change. Change comes from within, change comes from grassroots movements, and um, it would behoove the Iranian people to organize on the ground inside Iran to give, if you know, from, from the West, if we care and we want to have, you know, some sort of, uh, to help them, to give them some sort of hand, it would be to help them organize, to help them um, find a leader, to, to, to go to the next level. Like you said in Venezuela, it's that we know that the people are disenchanted. We know that we, they want change. We know that they want this government gone. But what next? How can they organize in order to shape their own futures? Now, I think you said it perfectly, no to Iran, but yes to who? Uh, Pakalavi could be that who, but as you mentioned, he has the challenge that he's not in Iran, right? So it's hard to galvanize 
the, the local sentiments from 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 abroad, especially if Iran the regime controls the, all the information channels uh, within the country. Uh, I'll share a quick anecdote, and I know you you're short on time, Lisa, so I want to ask you one last question before we go. But I remember when uh, the Venezuela situation was getting uh, a lot more attention in 2019, when the United States and 50 other plus countries recognized Juan Guaido. Uh, I was at a meeting with uh, members of the Iranian opposition actually here in Washington, D.C. And I remember they were telling me, said, wow, this the Guaido situation is really interesting. Maybe we could find a Guaido. Maybe we have our own Guaido. Right. And I, I just kind of tempered it a little bit. And I said, well, let's see how that works out first. If that's right. going to change anything. And what we learned is it's much more difficult than it seems. But uh, uh, Lisa, for the last question, and, and you know, we talked a lot about Iran, let's focus a little bit on, on policy, uh, especially U.S. policy. What is your make of the Biden administration's policy on Iran? There's a lot of obviously rumors about the direction it can go, and there's obviously some signaling as well. Uh, how would you grade the policy up until this point? He's only been in power for about two months, give or take. But obviously, uh, this is one of the priorities for the administration, uh, uh, whichever way it goes. Uh, so how do, you, how do you assess the Biden administration's policies on Iran up until this point? And where do you think it's going to be headed uh, in the future? You know, overall, um, and I've said this before, overall, the Biden uh, foreign policy across the board, or I should say domestic policy as well, has been ideology versus reality, meaning they came in with a certain ideology. We're going to be lax on immigration. We're going to open the borders. We're going to go back into the Iran nuclear deal. Then they meet up with reality. They face the fact that, you know, these caravans are showing up on our border. Are we going to really have that kind of lax immigration policy that, that they promised? Well, it's, again, ideology versus the reality. Uh, with the Iran deal, it's a similar analogy. Uh, they said they're going to get right back into an Iran nuclear deal, and they wanted to. And they've done things to signal that they are ready to get right back in. They took the Houthis. They, that is a terror organization in Yemen that is fully backed by the Iranian regime off of the FTO, the, the foreign terror uh, list, they have signaled that they are ready to sit down at talks with the rest of the um, the, the nations that are signatory to the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, and they have accepted Iran's threats of you know, enriching more uranium up to 60%, not allowing the IAEA to go in for surprise inspections. We, they've said nothing. Um, they are just waiting uh, like, like a desperate boyfriend or girlfriend for the Iranians to come back so that they can, you know, fulfill this promise. But again, we're meeting up with the reality of the situation. And that reality is that it's not going to be as easy to get back into an Iran nuclear deal. The, uh, the, the setting has changed quite a bit since 2015. You have an entirely different Middle East, thanks to the Abraham Accords. You have the moderate Arab nations turning their backs to Iran uh, and, and trying to stop Iran's uh, hegemonic agenda and growing in the region. Uh, you have these Arab nations being much more friendly to Israel and not allowing Iran to flex its muscles the way that it has in the past. Uh, and you have a Biden administration that is, again, very enthusiastic to get back into a deal, but it seems as though the Iranian regime believes that they have the leg up, they have the leveraging uh, in their, they have the ball in their court, um, and they're continuing to leverage. They said they're not even sitting down before sanctions are removed, uh, and they will, they, 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 that's, that's their condition. So when you have President Biden saying, we want to get in without, you know, no preconditions, and the Iranian regime says, remove the sanctions, you know, it's a game of chicken. We're going to see who's going to blink first. But um, the bottom line is this, Joseph, and I want to leave you with this very important thought. We know that the Biden administration wants a deal with Iran. That's a very dangerous place to start from the, the end result, right? It's a very dangerous place to tell your opponent, well, I, you know, I want to buy this house. So you're, you're, you know, the real estate agent's going to say, well, I'm going to charge you the maximum amount because you want to buy this house. I already know your bottom line, right? So when we know the Biden administration's bottom line is that they want a deal. We know that the Iran regime's bottom line is that they want a deal, but they want it to be on their terms. We're eventually going to have a deal. And, the party that's being excluded from this conversation is that the, the Iranian people, they're 82 million people strong. They're letting us know that they don't want this regime. They're letting the uh, the United States know that the pressure campaign that, that was uh, applied by President Trump was working for them because they were able to apply pressure on their government. 
and they're telling us that that we should listen to their narrative. So um, you know, there's there's a lot of places to look right now, but uh, it's moving very fast. As you said, we have been here. For, what the Biden administration has been in office for about two months, and we're moving extremely fast to do an about face, a 180 on all of the Trump era uh, foreign policy. But again. The ide ideology versus reality. When we face the reality of it, it's not a deal we want to rush back into, especially on the Iranian regime's terms. No, I think that's perfectly said. And, and, I, and I like how you do that, that juxtapose of ideology versus reality. Or I was having a conversation earlier today where you can do it with intent versus outcome, right? So right. Say in, in, in relation to the immigration policies, if I were to judge President Biden on his intent, I'd give him an A. I think he's trying to do a good job. But on the outcomes, I'd give him an F, right? He's not accomplishing right. what, he, what he is intending to do. So Lisa, thank you so much, uh, not just for being on the show with Seguridad Sin Filtros, but for all the work you're doing uh, on uh, the foreign desk, all the work you're doing with your website, with uh, your coverage of issues, and giving a voice to the voiceless, uh, where can uh, the audience find you? Where can they follow you? Where can they sign up for your your social media and your lists? Sure, you can go to uh, Twitter. You can uh, find everything there, but you can also go to my website, foreigndesknews.com, where you can sign up for the daily email and you can see the weekly podcast there as well. If you're on uh, a fan of YouTube, you can go to youtube.com slash Lisa Daftari. Uh, and you know, go to my um, website, you can see it all there. No, absolutely. And, I, and I'm going to tell the whole audience to please subscribe to Lisa's YouTube page. She's having a weekly, a wonderful show, a weekly show with the, some of the best experts, uh, former Trump administration officials, uh, current uh, experts and members of the Iranian opposition, people that are actually engaged in the issue uh, directly, either because they're uh, from Iran or because they're uh, living in Iran. So I think that, that that's going to be very important here going into the future. Thank you again, Lisa, uh, for joining us. And we hope to have you again sometime and maybe entice you to come to Latin America once this COVID situation subsides. Oh, I can't wait to get on another airplane. <laughs> Thank you, Joseph. Okay, I think so.